<laughs> What's up, fam? How are y'all doing? I, was, I always have a joke. I was thinking when the, you guys were talking so much, I told him whenever a lot of people are talking, just start praying, and all of a sudden people stop talking, and then say, all right, guys, pay attention. But you guys didn't stop talking. And I was thinking about, I just started dating this girl uh, for the second time. And um, <laughs> she talks a lot, girls talk a lot. And I was like, I've heard what it's like 90,000 words that they, they speak a day compared to men do like 10. And so I'm like, y'all, you gotta like reserve your words. You're like getting all out before 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, if y'all will, I wanna pray. I always like to pray before I start. Um, and then, yeah, we'll get into it. Lord, thank you for, yeah, this, don't take it lightly when I get an opportunity to speak specifically to men. Um, I think especially of this ministry that's been going on for quite a while, it's clear that you've built a culture here, you've built community here, you've built uh, something very, very special in that you've built a, a place for men to be vulnerable, uh, where they don't just try to impress each other, but they also impact each other when they share their scars. Uh, God, I, I pray that there would be more and more next-gen leaders that join this community, hear about this community, uh, would wake up early in the morning to join this community. Um, Lord, I, yeah, would you use my time? Would you use my words? Would you, uh, even my testimony, in some way to help encourage maybe a parent that's trying to raise their millennial child or maybe an employer that's just trying to um, train up or even retain their millennials? that keep leaving God. Uh, let, this, let us all be able to leave with one point of action. Uh, let us not just learn more, but let us go and be more due to what you've done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so um, I don't know what y'all were doing in 1990, but 1990 was a very, very big, impactful year in my life. There's two reasons why. Uh, two really big things happened. One, I was born, and so that really impacted who I am today. <laughs> Ouch. Okay, see, someone always takes it as an offense because you weren't born around that time. You were born like decades before. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that's when I was born. No control over it. But two, uh, the second thing that happened was very, very influential thing for millennials is a TV show was launched in September. It's called The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Have you guys heard of this show? Watch this show? Maybe one of the most quotable intro songs uh, in any TV show. This is a story all about how my life got twisted upside down. It, or specifically, I was in Philadelphia and there, we were going to West Philadelphia and I was like, born and raised in the playground. Like, maybe y'all didn't grow up with this song. Um, <coughs> wow, I really, I'm, this is a wake up call to me. Like, they did not grow up watching this. But one of the things, this, this show for millennials was a very popular show. Uh, Will Smith got his launch from this show. And uh, the specific episode I want to point out, there's a chapter in my book that's based off of, uh, it's introed with this uh, episode. It's called, if you know um, James Brown, he has a song called, um, I think it's Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. Uh, okay, so y'all know that song. <laughs> I do not know that one. Uh, it's called Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. And so this is the most popular episode in six seasons. I'm going to show you the last scene and why it is the most popular episode. The most popular episode um, of the six seasons of one of the most popular shows for millennials, especially, and in the 90s, it's called, instead of Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, they named it Papa's Got a Brand New Excuse. And it's a story about when Will's father, who's been gone for, uh, I want to say about 15 years, he'll say it in there, uh, just shows up out of nowhere and tries to join his uh, son's life. But Phil, Uncle Phil, who's been taking care of him for quite a while now, is like, I'm, I'm worried he's going to come in and he's just going to swoop back out. And I just want to show this video because at the core of the millennial generation, I think there's a couple issues we're going to get into it. But one of them I do think is that this may just be the most fatherless generation that we've seen in a good while. And I think this video is a great depiction of any of us because I don't think fatherlessness is a new thing for millennials. I just think it, I think it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And so maybe you, even I'd like to ask this question before I show it. How many of you guys grew up in a home where your mother was more of the spiritual cultivator or spiritual leader. I know for me that, that was the case. And I think uh, even for my parents' generation or for my uh, generation, their parents, it just keeps going where it's like, I don't know about y'all, every Sunday when we woke up, my mom uh, was waking us up. My mom's Mexican and then my dad's African-American. I know you're like, how, how, where's the complexion? Um, he's a white African-American, he's from South Africa. 
Uh, it's <laughs> still technically African American though. I always like to tell people I am African American. Um, if I'm signing up for a scholarship, I'm African American um, <laughs> or Mexican, whatever is convenient, I am that. Um, but my mom's a little five foot Mexican lady getting all of us boys, three boys, up and then every morning, like, honey, are you going to help me get these kids up? We don't want to go to church at all. And she would always like nudge them. I don't know if you have this wife that's like, are you going to help me get the kids up? And my dad would say, what I think a lot of you guys may say, or many Christian men Sunday morning say, and he's like, oh, guys, uh, listen to your mom. Come on, guys. And we were just, okay, he doesn't actually want to go. Like, he's getting instigated to go, and we just had to go to church. And so I, don't, I just think this fatherlessness, or even spiritual fatherlessness, has really impacted this generation. So let me show the video real quick. Again, Papa's got a brand new excuse is what it's called. You know, that, that uh, scene wasn't actually supposed to go that way. Uh, he was supposed to just shrug it off. Uh, he actually surprised uh, Uncle Phil, the actor. If you notice, he doesn't really say much. He's kind of like, Phil, hey. Uh, he was supposed to just shrug it off and act like it didn't matter, but he wanted to respond the way he felt like many young uh, friends of his had responded that didn't grow up with fathers or grew up with distant dads. And so he kind of ad-libbed. And that's why, if you notice, like, the hat, you're kind of like, it, it, got a, it was a hindrance. Normally in TV, it's like, hey, we just reshoot that and not do it again. That was the very first take, and they're just like, they said the whole set was kind of like in tears that they said, this has got to be the shot. This was so real and raw, and so they kept it. Uh, but I just, I feel like that is such a great depiction of a, this fatherlessness issue, let alone a, a spiritual fatherless issue, because I would say Lou in this story is a, a deadbeat dad, as the term many have used for someone who kind of gives up responsibility for their kids. But you know, I, I grew up in Louisville, and for my, my two best friends growing up, middle school to high school, they never met their dad. They never, or he left when they were like three years old. So they, they never really knew their dad. Uh, but for me, I found there's this other type of dad. Uh, as I became a Christian, I actually got saved the very first time I went to uh, Fellowship Church in Grapevine. Uh, there's a whole story behind that. But I started meeting a lot of suburban Christians, because if you don't know, Louisville is a little different than the Capel and South Lake and Grapevine. Um, and I, when I met more of these suburban Christians, uh, I found a lot of my younger friends, they didn't have deadbeat dads. I would say they had distant dads. They had these dads that didn't leave when they were three years old. They would say, no, my dad's in my life. He's just not actually in my life. Like, he's physically there. He's just spiritually and emotionally absent. And so in a way, it's kind of like the deadbeat dad son could say, man, I don't really know my dad. He left me when I was a kid. Um, but yeah, I don't really know him. While the distant dad's kid could say, yeah, I see my, my dad every, every night. He comes home from work, but I don't really know him. Like, he just checks out. He veges out. He, anytime he can go to do his hobby or his thing to get away from the, the home, that's what he wants to do. I, so every now and then, he wants to do something with the family, but... I, at this point, I don't even know my dad. And so one is like a, a punch to the gut when they were a child. The other is a punch to the gut every single day to the point where you just numb. I'm never going to have a relationship with my father. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? And so what do we do about this? And I, I'd say um, I'm always like the millennial guy, the guy that talks about millennials. I'm, I'm actually I'm turning 29 this weekend. And so it's my last year in the 20s. Um, and, you know, I've come to the conclusion that I don't think we have a millennial problem. I think that we have a discipleship problem, and it's playing itself out into a millennial problem. And, you know, the Z generation, is, which is high school and below, it's going to play itself out into a Z generation problem. Because at the core is a discipleship problem. If we don't fix this issue of Christians, or I would even say disciples, us, because most of us would say, we consider ourselves to be disciples of Jesus Christ, but I found that most disciples of Jesus Christ are not discipling anyone like Jesus Christ. Statistically, only about 12% of individuals, Christians, have a regular meeting with someone younger in the faith. So barely one out of 10 Christians actually have committed to do what Jesus said to do. Not only what he said to do, what he committed most of his ministry doing, which was pouring into someone younger in the faith. And I'm just saying one person, uh, they found that 2% actually do a type of, of joining my life and inclusion type of discipleship. And so, again, what's the real issue? The millennial issue or the discipleship issue? In fact, uh, if I was running for president, I always say that I came up with this campaign all by myself. 
Um, it would be, this would be my campaign for the president of the church. By, again, my whole marketing team spent months coming up with this. I came up with it by myself. It's this red hat. Um, and it would simply say this term right here, and I'll actually show it to you as well. Make the commission great again. That's what I would say. If, if, if we could just do that for 2019, it's just simply make the commission great again. And here's what I mean is, Jesus' last words should probably be our first priority. Like, you probably choose your last words very carefully, especially Christ. He was very intentional. And his last words were, go and do what? Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe and obey, not just to know and memorize, but to observe and obey all that I have commanded you. Um, again, we don't have a millennial issue. We have a discipleship issue. And it's not that it started with millennials. I think we've been having a discipleship issue for a long time. We've been so focused on uh, gaining attendance instead of building an army. And it just doesn't work, y'all. Like, like I'm speaking to the choir. We are, we are Christians in Dallas, Texas. I always feel like, is this not the greatest? Is Dallas, Texas maybe not one of the greatest testimonies that just building bigger audiences doesn't actually transform a city? In the world, I mean, we have 4,800 churches here in Dallas. 4,800. Just to get an idea, if you wanted to go to a different church every single Sunday just to see the beauty of the body of God, I mean, it would take you 92 years to go to every single church on a different Sunday. For most of y'all, it's, it's way too late. Like, you don't have enough time to do it. Like, <laughs> I'd have to write a book about it, or like you could start it for your son or their grandson. Uh, it's a lot of churches, and not just that, not just that we have a lot of churches, y'all, we have a lot of large churches. Like if I wanted to know where is, uh, like, where's Plano? Well, I, we could go outside and we'll see the top of Prestonwood from here, and we just walk that direction. Like if I wanted to know where's Dallas, like there's a church over there, like we could almost know, what, we don't need the sun, we just need these mega churches in every part of the city, and we can know where to go. Um, we have massive churches. I mean, this is one of the only cities I've seen a pastor say, oh, I've got a small church, and they're like, oh, how many people? Well, it's not, yeah, it's not, not, yeah, we're pretty, I mean, we're decent size, like about 3,000. I'm like, dude, you know anywhere else up north, that's like the biggest church in the city? Only here is the number so disproportionate that you have this, like, insecurity that you have a small church because it's not 10,000, it's five campuses. Uh, we have big churches, and here's my point. If getting as many people into a building to hear the Word of God, and I do think that's incredibly important. Jesus did it on Sermon on the Mount. It's very important. But if that was the main thing he called us to do, don't you think that our city should look different? Should it? But it doesn't. Like, shouldn't it look significantly different than other cities? For example, human trafficking, we're the number two location, hottest location for, uh, or hot spot for human trafficking to Houston. And we have all these churches and Christians here. We have 91% uh, of at least DISD kids are not graduating college ready in math and science. And we have all these Christians here. We are one of the uh, highest rep, uh, recipients of refugees, especially when you put Dallas and Fort Worth together. Uh, and most Christians have never gone to their Samaria, if you will, and have no refugee friends, even though we're the number one when you combine those two together for refugees. We, the mayor announced, I think it was two years ago, that we have the third largest disparity gap between the rich and the poor, where you can be in one neighborhood that's one way and a whole different neighborhood within a minute. We have a lot of issues that are just as much as every other city, if not worse, even though we have this Sunday so many more Christians going to church than every other city in the world. And so maybe the issue isn't just trying to gain an audience, maybe it's getting the Christians to go build an army of disciple makers. Um, what does it look like? Let's, let's talk about it a little bit. Um, for me, discipleship, it needs to be different. We need to differentiate what discipleship is and what mentorship is. Jesus didn't say to Peter, hey, come and meet with me. Jesus said to Peter, come and follow me. And so mentorship is good, but mentorship is adding something to your calendar. Uh, the first guy, I was very fortunate to, I got saved when I was 16. And two weeks later, a man named Kevin Batista asked if he could disciple me. I thought that that was normal. I thought that's what Christians do. I didn't really grow up too much in church other than when my mom could get us to go. And so 
it was only until like three or four years later when I got older and people were like, why are you so much more mature than other young people? Or how do we find other young people like you? Or can you share what I should do with my young person? And I started realizing what makes me so different. And I kept finding that I was pointing to these older men that have poured into me. I was like, that's the differentiator is that I had older men invest in me. It wasn't my father, but it was these guys that took me under their wing and discipled me. And what he sometimes did, but not really, is the mentorship, which is meeting over coffee. Or one, I remember one time he took me to Luby's, uh, a restaurant no millennials go to unless an older person <laughs> invites them. Like, like, I mean, some of my young guys are here. Have you, when was the last time someone in our generation said, let's go, I was thinking Luby's tonight. Like, is it even open at night? No, I'm serious. Is it open at night? I've never gone by and seen it. It seems like a lunch place. Y'all can like Luby's, all right? It's okay. Like, I think it's great. I, don't, I wish more millennials liked it. There's like great options. Uh, <coughs> but mentorship is come and meet with me. Discipleship is come and follow me. Let me tell you why this, and by the way, as I've already said, in most church events, are just come and listen to me. I mean, every, every Sunday, I feel like the call to action isn't go and make disciples. It's come back next week. And then once you come back next week, it's come back next week. Usually, I don't know about your church, but this one, my church, churches, I always speak of these different churches. It's like after, they're always like, guys, wasn't that an incredible message? And there's something about pastors, they do this with their hands whenever they're announcing the next sermon. Next week, we're starting a new series. And they talk like this. I'm like, dude, you never talk like this, except for when you're promoting the next sermon on next week. Like, and it's like, that was incredible. Next week. And they always say this, you don't want to miss it. They always do that. Like, what is it about that that gets us to not want to miss it? And then we do go to the sermon next week, and the next week they're like, man, wasn't that an incredible message? Guys, next week, you don't want to miss it. And then next week, and repeat this for the rest of our lives until we die. That's what it feels like. And I'm like, it turns church into this hobby. And at best, I'm supposed to attend. The call to action by Christ is not that. It is go and make disciples into all nations. And like, you are the, the plan. And why I love speaking to guys like you is because how many of y'all are not in paid staff for uh, a church? You're in the marketplace or you're doing something outside of the church. Great. To me, man, honestly, as a millennial to leaders that are leading millennials, whether you like it or not, um, and I know they're punks. Uh, let me just say that right out. Like, they're like Peter... Just passionate, cutting people's ears off, like doing all this dumb stuff, correcting Jesus, getting called Satan every now and then. Uh, like they're, they're like just doing dumb stuff. I always say one of the worst methods for evangelism is cutting a guy's ear off. Like it's not a good strategy. And so I'm not saying millennials are the best, but I'm saying that like, man, I just think that you guys in the marketplace, that's why I, I, my ministry is to train marketplace millennial missionaries. Because if seven out of 10 young people are not going to church, they are going to work. Now, I know they don't go for a long time. Right now, millennials are on the trajectory to have, to have 14 jobs by the time that they're 40 years old. It's a lot of jobs. They are job hopping. What if you built a community and culture in your workplace that was incredibly intentional to raise up, train, and even disciple, if you could use that word, millennials into your, your workplace? Because I would say they're looking for purpose and significance. And I think uh, there's very few organizations, especially not college, colleges and, and workplaces are not creating that type of culture. And so they're looking for it somewhere else. And, and I think millennials are not wise to just always be job hopping. I always tell them if you're changing your ladder every two years, you're never going to see what's at the top. And so I don't think it's right. I'm just saying, what if you were set apart in the culture at your workplace because you're like, we're going to start training up millennials. You call it a leadership pipeline. You maybe not call it discipleship, but there's not a lot of workplaces that are like that. I found that millennials were mostly coddled when they were young by their parents, and now they're being criticized by their bosses. And so there's this middle ground where they're not coddled and they're not criticized, but I would say where you could come in and you could coach them where you could coach them and train them. And a coach doesn't do the work for you, but he does challenge you, and he does feel the hit when we lose. It, it's not just, I'm going to criticize you and throw rocks, from you, throw rocks at you from afar. All saying that, also I would say, if you are not discipling someone, would you please refrain from criticizing the next generation? Like, if you do not have someone that says, you are the guy who that is, it shows, like Christ chose his young guys, 
you chose to disciple me, if you do not have someone that would say, you're the guy, and you we had a conversation, a commitment. They say my generation's really bad at uh, commitments. We're non-committal. We're not good at relationships. Like, if you ask some young couple, are you guys dating? They're like, no, we're just talking. Like, t- talking about what? Like, or, no, that means like you're in a, we're starting to maybe consider dating. We're talking. Or no, we're kind of, uh, they have all these different words. Like, we're talking. We're dating. We're, we're not, it's very ambiguous what the relationship looks like. Do you have an ambiguous relationship with the next generation, or do you have a very clear relationship? I want to disciple you. Follow me as I follow Christ. I'm not perfect, but just try to follow me as I follow Christ. If you don't have someone like that, please refrain from dis- criticizing the next generation. Because the hardest thing I'm going to say today is, you're a part of the problem. You are a part of the problem because you have not gotten in the game yet. You're attending church, and that's great. You're, you're, I would say you're in this season right here where you are a learner. You've chosen to stage one, which is great, but you've decided to remain at stage one. You may have been a Christian for 10 years, 5 years, 5 minutes, but if you're not pouring into someone else, you're still just a learner. You're, in a way, you're not ready to feed somebody else. Uh, Paul talks about you need milk still. You're not eating like the substance and then able to then go give that to somebody else. I want you to move up to a leader where you start saying, I have an exclusive relationship with someone that I'm pouring into. And then I really would love for you to be a disciple maker. What I love about uh, multi-level marketing people is they're really, really good at this. They are very, they have clear cut uh, lanes, if you will, and stages. It's kind of like, they'll be like, you're ruby, and then you're diamond, and then you're double diamond, and then you're infinity stone. And it just keeps like growing and growing and growing. Like, I'm serious, that's what they do. Um, and those guys move. They're like, oh, once I hit this stage, I get a pink Cadillac. Or once I get to this, like they have these markers. And I know we like to critique it, but I do like that they've given clarity to their people of how to get to the next thing. For church, again, it's Guys, next week, you got to be there. Be a bringer. Bring someone else at best. This is really what I think God called us to do. This is what the disciples did. I mean, Paul, Paul was up there. There's Paul and Timothy, and then he said, train others who can train others. This is what we've been called to do. And, it, and I've seen it, and it works. Um, this is a pastor in Seattle that I saw this. I knew that he discipled the guy with the blazer, um, and I said, is this who that guy, Brian, discipled? And is this who discipled you? I saw this picture frame in his office. And he was like, yeah, it is. That's, that's uh, kind of the, uh, the, the older guy on the le- far left is the guy who discipled me. He had never met the guy I had discipled. And so he clearly had never met the guy that he had discipled. And so I just think, man, how incredible would it be if every Christian could have a picture like this at the end of their life? Whether... I mean, this was a retreat that they had done. They said, we wanted to meet each other because we had always heard about each other. We would never met each other. And so they went on a retreat. But how powerful would it be for you to meet the person that's two generations, three generations down from an investment that you made in someone in the next generation? Again, it looks, that looks a lot more like Jesus than I think just speaking in front of big stages. Because, uh, by the way, the one time Jesus did the really big event, the 5,000, um, which probably was more because I was only 5,000 men, so they think it was about 10 to 20,000 with women and children. The one time he did the big event, he was doing the stuff that we get appreciate, because in Dallas, we're all about the big event. We love those things. The big event shows up, and then it leaves, and then we want the next big event. Um, we, it's, that stuff is really sexy and really cool. This is the hard stuff that no one sees, so we don't always want to do this kind of stuff. But when Jesus finally got it right, I guess, in our terms of leadership, what does he do with the 5,000? He does preach to them, but what does he do afterwards? Does he start a conference? Does he start a megachurch? It would be a great start to a megachurch. No, he doesn't. He gets on a boat, he chunks the deuce, which means he said goodbye, um, and he continues to disciple the 12 disciples. And if anyone did that in Dallas today, had 5,000 hungry unbelievers following them into this place, not even caring about food, and they're so hungry to learn the word of God, and then they just left and said, okay, I'm going to continue discipling my, my small group of, of young people. We would think, what a bad stewardship. Like, what a missed opportunity. What, like, what a bad follow-up. But maybe Jesus is, knows what he's doing. I mean, we're here because of the disciples. I don't know where the 5,000, and I don't even know where everyone was from Palm, uh, 
from the uh, parade that came in when he came in on the donkey. None of them were there after the cross that we see. And so maybe there's something to this. Um, I, I've started to get to see this in my own life. Uh, let's say I disciple someone. Uh, I wish I had a pointer. I could show it to y'all. I've seen, there's a guy, Connor, I disciple. And then he's got a younger guy that I've gotten to meet. About two years ago, I met the guy who he disciples. And the kid, if you haven't noticed, I got these like little tweetable statements. I say a lot of like sticky statements. He said one of them. And I said, dude, that's good. Where did you hear that? It was the younger guy, my disciple's disciple. And he's like, oh, man, Connor says this all the time. I'm like, good, man. It, I, I trained him. I taught him. I am thinking. And I said, well, where did, he, where did he get that? And he said, no, I mean, he came up with it. And I'm like, no, no, I came up with that. And he's quoting my stuff. Uh, it, but again, disi- fruit is when um, discipleship is when your fruit grows on other people's trees. And no one knows. That is multiplication. I mean, I think the enemy so much is focusing on division right now. You turn on the news. And he's trying to divide us racially, uh, denominationally, I think generationally, politically, every way that he can divide us. He knows he can't defeat us. But Jesus literally said, the gates of hell will not defeat the church. He can't even defend himself from the church. So if I was the enemy and I'm like, I can't defeat the church, I would think, well, if I can't defeat the church, let me divide the church. Then it's not a church. It's not the church. It's a whole bunch of churches that think that it's their church. And they do all their things. And so I don't think we lack resources. And I don't think we lack uh, very talented people. I don't think we lack different generations and the leadership in that. Uh, I don't think we lack the right strategy. I think we lack unity among generations, ethnicities, socioeconomic classes. And so, again, my plea to you is what if in 2019 you're like, hey, I'm done being a learner. I've been a Christian for too long to just continue being a learner where I'm receiving and I'm not pouring out. And, and let me just confess to y'all, I know, I know that many of y'all never got discipled. Like many of y'all never got someone to pour into you. But if you're the kind of Christian man that didn't grow up with a Christian father, I found this strong passion among Christian men that grew up in a lineage of uh, bad dads and or uh, men that were far from God. There's this burden in them to change the trajectory in their kids' life and the legacy and lineage that they leave, I would say in the same way, we could blame every generation before us and say, you didn't disciple us, who didn't disciple us, and y'all didn't disciple us, and now here we are. I would say, let's just say the buck stops here. We're going to try at our best to start pouring into someone in the next generation so that they can better reach the next generation. Because that's what I'm challenging my guys for. And I'm challenging my own generation to trick older generations to disciple their generation so that we'll be prepared to disciple the Z generation. Does that make sense? Because if y'all think millennials are bad, and I know they're, they're punks, they're difficult, they are noncommittal, they are transient, they are uh, slacktivist, where they, they're activists on their computer, uh, they are all these bad things. But if y'all think that we're this bad, imagine what the Z generation is going to be like when the whole millennial generation mostly walked away from the Lord and just did what Judges says, and they just did what was right in their own eyes, and they did what was right in their own eyes. I say millennials are like Lord of the Flies right now. Just raising themselves on an island, making up their own rules. They have no adult supervision and or guidance and or wisdom. And it's like sixth graders asking other sixth graders for dating advice. You need need a married relationship to give you advice. Um, Piggy's going to die in the end of this this movie, if you know what I'm talking about. And so we, we need you. I would say the best young leaders that I've ever met especially if they're in their 20s and they have a national impact, whether it's in business and they're in their 20s, they have a national impact in church or in ministry. Every single time I ask them, who discipled you? Who mentored you? Who poured into you? Who connected you? Who believed in you at a young age? Who gave you responsibilities you didn't deserve at a very young age? They've never said no one. Every single time they're like, dude, a ton of people. How did you know? I'm like, because there's no way you have this kind of wisdom, this kind of resources, this kind of connections, unless older people helped you. We need you to do what kind of, Saul always gets a bad rap, but we need you to do what Saul did for David. I mean, Saul did do a lot of bad things, but one thing I think he did is we don't tend to like to give young people big responsibilities, because if they fail, which they probably will, because you just do fail when you're first getting started, when they fail, they'll mess up and mess everything up for us. So we want to, them to fail small, and then it's a small uh, impact on our lives. Well, I found uh, this is with organizations. Like, 
I know so many organizations across the nation where there's like 20 somethings that are reaching so much people, thousands of people, and they're like very underfunded, very under resourced, and very little mentorship. And I'm like, dude, why are we not getting behind the next generation leaders that are reaching the next generation? Um, and here's the deal David, though, and Saul, Saul didn't give him a small responsibility. I would say he gave him the biggest responsibility you can give him. If David lost, it impacted everything. It's a huge responsibility. And worse than that, because there's another thing. Then we're like, but if a millennial comes in and we pour so much into them, we believe in them, we invest in them, then they might mess everything up and they're going to try to do things different. They're going to try to change things. They're going to try to do all this. David comes in, puts on the armor, and he's like, nah, I'm good. By the way, the only way Saul knew him was for playing music for him. It's not like I know you for being like this dominant giant killer. No, he was only on the battlefield because he was bringing food and cheese for the warriors. Like, Saul had every reason to say, your generation scares me, and especially you, you're not ready to do this. But Saul believed in him. Bigger than that, he didn't force him to wear his armor, or I would say he didn't force him to do it the way he had always seen it done. I mean, y'all, if seven out of ten young people are leaving the church, there has to be some new innovative ways to reach the next generation. Again, I think it's the marketplace because... In a sense, pastors are losing their influence with the next generation. It's no longer come as you are. Young people don't come. And so it's go where they are. You are where they are. You are the marketplace. In a way, you are the pastors to the next generation. I would just say, are you discipling them or are you criticizing them? Um, and so, again, everything was on the line. David came through. Uh, let, me, let me see how I'm doing with time because I'm probably close to... Any comments, questions? Because actually, no, I'm not going to do that. Let me tell one last story, y'all. Um, I think that I want to show, make sure that I leave. Here's what I think that would be very powerful is what do you do when you say, come and follow me? I would say, have them join your life. And there's four quadrants of your life that I put in the book. Your work life, your church life, your personal life, and your family life. Um, these are the different sectors that I say. Again, all this is in the book. It's very spelt out. It's incredibly practical. The book is actually even broken down. There's a table of contents that says, these are the best chapters if you're a business leader reading this in context for millennials. These are the best chapters if you're a parent and you're thinking about millennials. This is the best chapters if you're a pastor and you're thinking about millennials. And so um, I just want to tell this quick story to end it is the beauty of discipleship is that it's not adding one more thing to your calendar. I know the number one excuse to not discipling someone is I'm way too busy. They'll just say, I'm too busy. And here's the truth. You're too busy. You are too busy. We're just the, one of the busiest nations out there. But discipleship isn't adding something to your calendar. It's including someone in your calendar. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean you change your calendar. Jesus didn't change anything on his calendar for the disciples. The disciples changed everything on their calendar for Jesus. So that means you've got to find extremely hungry young people. Um, again, this is, this is in the book, but... Uh, you got to find faithful, available, teachable, compatible, but especially hungry young people. Because you can be available all day, but if they're not hungry, you can't disciple them. Um, so it, it's not adding one more thing, it's including them. Um, and so with this guy, he's one of the guys who currently disciples me. His name is Raymond Harris. He is the uh, architect. He has the architect firm that mostly is known for doing architecture for this new startup that's doing pretty well these days out of Arkansas. The, I always go blank on the name of the startup. Um, called Walmart. Yeah. Um, have y'all heard of this startup? It's doing well. Like, it's really done well the last, like, couple decades. Um, and so it's made this architect firm, from what I've heard, the third largest architect firm in the nation. That's a busy man that's the founder of this organization. So I knew, probably in its workplace, that's going to be hard to join. Because I'm not saying you got to follow in all four. But I knew, what about his personal life? That's the fun part. That's where you join their hobbies, the things they like to do. Well, Raymond likes to do what I don't like to do, really, in an early ungodly hour, and that's run. He likes to do the, the running thing. I said jogging once. They said, no, 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 no. Katie Trill, that's people that jog. He's like, we run. I was like, I think we jog, because I'm not running full pace. But I, I, clearly it's offensive to you, so we run. Um, <laughs> And here's the thing about these kind of guys. They love waking up crazy early, and they love putting stickers on their car, and they love just, they love bragging about running. And so I knew when I asked them, it's going to be hard. So I asked them, can we, uh, I know you've been busy. We've been trying to meet up. It took a year to get a meeting with him, a mentorship meeting, if you will. 
Uh, but then I asked him, I texted him, is there any way I could run with you? I'd love to get into running a little bit more. Um, and he said, oh, okay. Well, if you're serious, meet me tomorrow at four. I'm like, God, why, why, do y'all, what, why does it have to be this way? Like, um, but I, I'm like, okay, okay, I'll be there tomorrow at four. So I, I show up four in the morning at his office right there in downtown Dallas. And I'd love to say, y'all, this was one of the best discipleship moments of my life. But it was honest, it wasn't one of the worst, but it's definitely on the lower end because he didn't show up. Like, he just didn't show up for, until 7 a.m. And it's not that he showed up at 7 a.m., but his text message showed up at 7 a.m. when he said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I should have clarified. When I said 4, I definitely didn't mean 4 a.m. I meant 4 p.m. And I'm like, yeah, no, you definitely should have clarified. Because uh, who runs at 4 p.m.? And who says, if you're serious, meet me tomorrow at 4 p.m.? Like, what's so hard about that? Uh, but again, this dude now for two years has discipled me. And, and uh, again, my dad is not a, a Christian. And so he's been able to walk with me or I joke. He's been able to run with me through uh, father things, through dating the second time again, I told you all, uh, through leading a ministry, through doing all these things. That he's been one of the most influential guys in my life over the last couple of years. And I'd say, if you saw an, any ounce of wisdom in who I am today. Like, you're like, this kid is pretty smart for his years. And they say uh, they're, he's wise beyond his years. That's the kind of saying. Um, I would say I am wise beyond my years. Because older men that are wiser than me poured into me at a young age. And so again, I am who I am because of older men your age that decided I'm done just learning. I'm, it's time to start doing what Jesus said. His last words will be my first priority. And so if you guys will, I would just love to pray for y'all. Um, I will sign books in the back, and uh, it's one for 15 or two for 25. And um, yeah, I'd love to use that as a resource to start a discipleship relationship in 2019. God, thank you for these men. God, thank you for their story. I know um, there's a lot of men here that were never discipled. There's a lot of men that were maybe mentored, and there's a lot of men that maybe were discipled and poured into and believed in. But I have a feeling that every single guy here can think of at least one person that when they were young poured into them, believed in them, connected them, invested in them, did something that set a new trajectory for their life. And so God, I just pray that you would remind them of that and that you would um, excite them about the things of the Lord, excite them about uh, what you called them to do, and especially remove the enemy's lies that we, are ina- that we are not adequate to do it, that we're not equipped enough, that we don't know the word enough, that we're not living godly enough. Um, you use very broken men, and so I just ask that they would simply say to someone this year, would you highlight who that could be for them, that they would simply say, follow me as I follow Christ. Then not going to be a perfect life, and we're not looking for one, but let them have a real walk with the Lord that other young people in this generation, for the sake of your name in this city, can change through discipleship. In Jesus' name, amen.